Hello, my name is Cora Sternberg, and I'm he here with uh, eCancer TV uh, at the 51st annual meeting of the, uh, of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, which is being held in uh, Chicago. And I'd like to welcome my esteemed colleagues, Karim Fizazi, Noel Clark, and Eleni Efstathiu. And we heard some very interesting presentations this morning about prostate cancer, and we'd like to discuss them with you. I think I'll start off with the STAMPEDE trial. There's been a, a, a lot of interest about the STAMPEDE trial. This is an English trial in which they had a very innovative um, uh, trial design. The trial uh, ultimately has some 10 different arms, and they keep changing the arms as the um, as we are changing our way of thinking and the way we're treating prostate cancer. What was presented today was um, patients uh, with um, uh, hormone-naive disease who were treated with um, zoledronic acid and LHRH analog or were treated with a docetaxel chemotherapy and LHRH an analog or the, co or the combination as compared to LHRH analog. And what they found was an uh, uh, amazing uh, improvement in overall survival for those patients who receive docetaxel chemotherapy with LHRH analog. The zoledronic acid arm didn't seem to add much to um, the uh, results. Uh, there was a 22 months improvement in overall survival for patients, particularly patients with a newly presenting uh, M1 disease. And uh, I'd like to hear uh, your thoughts about that. Uh, Kareem, maybe you could try to put this into context with the Getog trial and the charter trial that we heard about last year at last year's ASCO. Right, thank you, Kara. I guess uh, I, I totally agree with you. We now have three trials all pointing to the same direction for M1 disease, specifically de novo metastatic disease. And the design of the other three trials, uh, at least this part of Stampede, were really the same, ADT versus ADT plus those tags are up front for these patients. In the three trials, JTUC uh, 15, Chartered and Stampede, progression-free survival was met, and overall survival showed or tend to the same direction, with significant uh, being uh, met in both Stampede and Chartered, and actually the difference is, is quite big and meaningful. And the same trend was found in the French trial. Not significant, but truly the French trial was, was smaller. Uh, we have to recognize that. And to me, today, this is uh, Stampede showing that we should change the way we treat these patients. And uh, uh, really, uh, my next patients with M1 disease will be proposed on the stack cell. As far as we're talking about fit patients, and of course patients who would accept chemotherapy, so you would propose this for all patients, or would you use the charted definition of those patients with uh, more high risk or volume disease, having visceral uh, uh, metastases, lung or liver, or having more than four bone metastases outside of the axial skeleton? You would propose this for all M1 patients? Right, probably at least all patients with bony metastasis and or visceral metastasis. Lymph node disease is, is perhaps a little different. And this is because uh, in the chartered trial, the magnitude of the benefit as measured by the hazard ratio was pretty much the same in what we call or they call low volume or high volume. Now, of course, because high volume patients are more, much more likely mm -hmm. to die soon, the median were, were reached uh, much more rapidly and the curves shows better uh, on the screen. And also they had uh, a much lower proportion of patients with low volume disease. And this is probably why uh, the, in this particular subgroup, the p-value doesn't look significant. But mm -hmm. really the hazard ratio is the same. And biologically speaking, we have no real reason to believe that chemotherapy would work differently in patients with two metastases versus four or five metastases. So I guess, uh, uh, and, and again, Stampede, uh, reported data for all M1 patients, not according to exactly. a, a measurement of the volume uh, of metastasis. So I guess the, the data should apply to all metastatic patients. Eleni, what, do, what are you going to do? Are you going to change your practice based on these trials? I'm definitely changing the practice with regard to the high volume disease. However, from a 
more conceptual perspective, I'm taking issue with the fact that in my mind, we're still assuming a unidimensional approach, whether we're dealing with phase three trials of novel agents or chemotherapy. We're in 2015, and as we were discussing during the session, we're making rounds the same, around the same objective. Instead of identifying the heterogeneity of these patients at the biological level and identifying which would be the ideal treatment, we're still having to decide one or the other based on these types of trials. And we need to change that paradigm is my concern, and I would like to hear I agree with you. Many, many of these are old trials. Well. The Stampede is not an old trial, but no. the, uh, the SWAG trial was an old trial that went on for a, a long time, and I think we, we are definitely changing our paradigm. The other trial, um, Karim, that was discussed uh, by Howard Sandler was with uh, using early chemotherapy with radiation. Do you want to mention something about that? Sure. I mean, that, that's also, of course, a very uh, interesting concept because uh, in most cancers where chemotherapy is active, we're using chemotherapy adjuvantly <coughs> together with any local treatment, either surgery or, or radiation therapy. That's true for breast, for colorectal, for even lung cancer lung. and others, but not prostate cancer. So chemotherapy obviously is active in this disease. So. Uh, Approximately 10 years ago, a series of randomized trials have started asking the question as to whether we should integrate the stack cell chemotherapy in the earlier stages for patients with high risk localized disease. And we now have data from three of these trials, and that's very recent, I mm -hmm. mean, in, in the last uh, three days, basically. We have JTUC12, which actually met its primary endpoint of uh, relapse-free survival, and this is just published two days ago, and this was again the primary endpoint. Overall survival is too early, even with an eight or nine, uh, month, uh, nine uh, year median follow up, we need more time to see overall survival because many of these patients are still alive. We have also Stampede, which has a, a category of patients with localized disease who were indirectly randomized to receive mm. chemotherapy or not. Same thing. Relapse free survival is met. Overall survival is premature because most of these gentlemen are still alive. And now we have the RTOG 12, which was reported this morning by uh, Howard Sandler. And this trial was looking at overall survival as at its primary endpoint. I believe it was reported perhaps a bit too early because they looked at a uh, five year uh, um, overall survival. And that what they reported was a 93% versus an 89% uh, rate for overall mm -hmm. survival. So it's a 4% difference. It looks significant, but really they used a one-sided p-value, which is not necessarily correct in, in such a large phase three trials. So I guess that to me, this is a good sign. The free trials definitely point to the same direction that chemotherapy can probably prevent relapse or defer relapse. Now, whether we should integrate it in daily practice, my personal answer for today is no. This is still experimental at the, mo uh, at the moment. We need a longer follow-up. It's still too early. Mm -hmm. It's funny because we've been, th for the last few years, been talking about all these novel agents and how we wanted to just delay chemotherapy and push chemotherapy only in concentrate-resistant prostate cancer patients. And now we're really talking about giving chemotherapy early to patients who have not even had hormonal therapy. So our, our parents paradigm is changing and changing all the time. Noel, there was um, uh, two um, presentations this morning about early um, hormonal therapy and giving hormonal therapy in patients with localized disease. Do you want to say something about those trials? Yes. Um, I'll start with the TOAD trial, which was uh, a uh, New Zealand and uh, Australian study run by the Trans-Tasman Group. Um, and this is uh, the latest in a series of studies which has addressed the question of uh, early versus delayed hormone therapy. And uh, for those who know the history of these trials, there are a number over the years which have uh, addressed this question, um, but never really recruited the number of patients that they needed to recruit. Uh, and so, for example, the, um, the MRC study did a trial of early versus delayed uh, hormone therapy in patients with, uh, uh, with M0 disease. The, uh, there are two ERTC studies, one by Fritz Schroeder, the other one published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology 2006 by Urs Studer. Um, so to give you an example of that, the uh, Studer uh, trial, 
which is looking at then clinical T3, T4, N0, M0 patients uh, randomized to early versus delayed uh, androgen deprivation. What that showed was that there was little difference for the majority of patients and about 43-45% of the patients uh, on the delayed uh, androgen deprivation therapy arm didn't actually need any androgen deprivation therapy at all because they died from other causes. Um, but again that was somewhat undernumbered an old trial. Now the TOAD trial was looking at this early versus delayed concept in a different setting and that was in patients who had undergone prior attempts at curative treatment either with radiotherapy or surgery and then had randomized the patients to receive uh, early or delayed hormone therapy on relapse. Uh, this study was planned to recruit about 750 patients and it came in uh, recruiting roughly about a third of its, uh, of its target population so quite a way under numbered and uh, what it showed was that there was a small but significant difference uh, in survival and, and uh, progression for those patients um, who had continuous hormone deprivation uh, at, uh, at the point of uh, relapse. Um, but of course there was a higher complication rate or side effect rate in that particular group of patients. The other thing to say is that in those who had uh, delayed therapy, roughly about a third of those started androgens within a couple of years. But again, in a manner commensurate with the Studer trial from 2006, um, about 40-45% actually didn't need any androgen deprivation at all. So the conclusion overall from that study uh, was that um, if a patient is to have androgen deprivation there are benefits to starting early uh, but there are trade-offs and, and uh, the trade-off is that the patient's on androgen deprivation for a longer period of time and they will have more side effects and the benefit actually is relatively small, about 10%, something of that order. Now in the uh, other trial, the JETUG-16 trial, was looking at the use of androgens supplementary to radiotherapy in um, patients who failed radical prostatectomy. Um, there are a series of three large studies which have looked at the issue of radiotherapy um, following radical prostatectomy, one from the US, the Southwestern Oncology Group study, an old study started in the 80s um, which sh has shown improvements both in progression-free survival um, and in overall survival. The second large study, which is uh, EURTC 22911, which is about a thousand or so mm -hmm. patients, um, showed a progression-free survival improvement but no improvement in overall survival. In fact, it was slightly worse. Uh, and then there is the German study run by Thomas Weigel, um, radiotherapist from Ulm in Germany, which again has shown progression-free survival improvements with radiotherapy but no data on overall survival. Now this French study, extremely well conducted study, about 700 or so patients, uh, randomizing equally to uh, radiotherapy or radiotherapy plus six months of androgen deprivation therapy, has shown a clear benefit in terms of progression-free survival. Um, there is another large study to follow this, which is the radical study in the UK. Currently that's recruited about 2,800 patients, uh, which is addressing the issue of radiotherapy versus six months versus two years hormone therapy. So this, this is a body of evidence which is gathering, which is uh, helping clinicians make the decision as to whether radiotherapy is needed, whether it should be given early, and if it should, whether it should be given with hormones. So I suppose one asks the question now, where are we in relation to hormone therapy given with radiotherapy for radical prostatectomy failure? And progression-free survival doesn't translate into overall survival. We'll need to wait longer for that from the JETUG-16 study, but it is promising data, and it does suggest that in addition to the radiotherapy effect, the hormones are potentially going to give benefit. Thank you very much. Yelene, tell us about the presentation that you gave today about neoadjuvant therapy with abiraterone. Oh, I think that it follows what we were discussing earlier, and I mentioned about the biologic heterogeneity of this disease, but it also follows along the lines of what Noel was suggesting, that you need probably more than one modality to treat the disease that is at a very high risk uh, of relapsing. So if we have a window, an opportunity for a cure, even if a fraction of those patients, we need to answer that unmet need that is there. And of course, Noel as a urologist uh, can tell us more about the newfound interest in prostatectomy in the high-risk setting.
So I think it's the perfect timing to try to understand which of these novel agents and, of course, the more standard agents like cytotoxics would be of benefit not only as neoadjuvant but probably as adjuvant treatments. And again, I believe strongly and I think the data that we showed today support that it will be in subsets of these patients. So we need to reclassify and eventually move beyond the late Gleason who implemented this Gleason scoring that was a blessing and turned out to also be a little bit of a curse because it has held up uh, the molecular classification of the disease. So we need genomic molecular classification, classification. to understand better which patients would benefit perhaps from, from chemo, combinatorial from modalities. combination, from novel therapies. So what we did is we decided, because it's not always the best or easiest way to access tissue by pretreatment biopsies, to randomize between a failed example across the board, LHRH treatment preoperatively, and LHRH plus abiraterone. That way you get prostatectomy samples that you can compare and come to some conclusion with regard to the abiraterone effect. And the bottom line is that the standard approaches to pathology staging of the disease do not seem to meet the threshold for identification of the cytoreduction induced by the novel therapies. And some more exploratory methodologies seem to be associating well with the rate of recurrence of that disease, meaning the tumor epithelium volume, the density of the cancer cells in the remaining volume of the tumor microenvironment. And when, then we went on to look at that molecular marker heterogeneity at both a protein and an RNA level. And what seemed to be well aligned, let's focus on the Abbey group, is that ARV7 presence does still associate like in the cancer treat resistant setting with a resistant to Abbey treatment disease. And that may be very well so for enzalutamide as well that I'm uh, How assuming often did you find tested. ARV7 presence in Not as often as in CRPC. Low, low uh, level of expression, mm -hmm. and it is about 30% of the specimens. So much lower as you saw in that data. And uh, what, uh, what is reported in CRPC? And uh, then we went on to look at associations with the glucocorticoid receptor because it seemed to be popping up as a signal in all the ABI treated. Mm -hmm. And higher expression of the glucocorticoid receptor trended very well with higher residual tumor volume, and of course, in that sense, relapse. And that higher glucocorticoid receptor volume was associated well with intraprostatic cortisol, creating a story for the ligand and the receptor right there. Mm -hmm. And of course, a lot of questions coming through that need to be further studied because we only used five milligrams of prednisone versus 10, and maybe 10 would have been a better option to stabilize the receptor because that cortisol that was measured was completely intraprostatic and separate from an exogenous prednisone. Some, some answers, but more questions being produced, I think, but a lot of interesting questions to be answered. I think we had forward. a very interesting session and we have a lot of questions, not a lot of answers. I think we're probably going to use chemotherapy earlier and we still have more questions about the earlier hormonal therapy and the earlier use of novel agents. So I'd like to thank all of you for being here today and thank you all from eCancer and at the uh, ASCO meeting in Chicago. <laughs>